we the schedule is kind of uh, shifted, so uh, we can do the whole talk if you wanna. We can do the half of it, <sighs> whatever you want. So um, the first half is instruction instruction encoding, and the second half is kernel stuff. So whatever you wanna, or we can do the whole talk. Yeah, the whole thing. Okay. Okay, so this is this is what I'm going to talk. We're talking about. Okay, first of all, uh, so my name is Boris Petkov, and I work at uh, Yoshi Kozina's team, and I do kernel like x86 stuff and RAS and uh, other other interesting things. Hopefully, <laughs> um, this talk. Well, yeah. Why am I doing this? I mean, instruction encoding x86. That's you know that's written like in everywhere and. And if you just want to look it up, you go look it up, and uh, everything is documented. And um, the reason why I did it is because uh, I, I, before Sousa was at AMD, I wa always wanted to understand how instruction encoding is done on x86. And I never got the time, because there's always something else. There's always something more important. And, um, and yeah, then when I started Sousa, there was this thing called Hack Week. So I was like, yeah, maybe this is a like, perfect project, you know? to do instruction encoding, to just try to learn it. And um, I thought maybe, well, the, how do I learn it best? Maybe write my own instruction decoder, like, like re-implement object dump, more or less. <laughs> and uh, this is what I did. And um, yeah, and then it got very interesting because you know, uh, I thought maybe not only de decoding instructions, but maybe decoding I interesting parts of the kernel of VM Linux might help us improve stuff or do binary patching or Elf editing and whatever. So uh, yeah, you see later. So let's start. Some history about in Intel and x86. Oh, I mean, we can talk a whole hour about this, and this is just the beginning. So I'm just gonna warm you up and then skip it. <laughs> I can skip it. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm going to do it fast. Uh, so the instruction set is backwards compatible even back to the first 8086 processor. Uh, so this is the Intel history. They started with a 4004. That's a 4-bit processor for, for Bizicom calculators. <laughs> and uh, the name that happens here, is, uh, that, that's very uh, uh, famous, is Federico Fagin, who did that. He was like the project leader. And he did a lot of a lot of work on transistors in Fairchild before that. After that, after Intel, he went to Zilog to 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 make a very successful competitor to the 8086 called Z80. Um, anyhow, so uh, one year later, like 72, they did their first 8-bit CPU, and the instruction set came from another company called DataPoint, and they were doing CRT terminals and needed a processor, so. It was kind of like collaboration. Uh, two years later, another 8080. It had an extended instruction set, and it was assembly source compatible to the, 80, it, uh, to the first 8-bit processor, which meant you have to rebuild everything for the 8080. And uh, one year later, no, three years later, <laughs> um, they did the 8085, which changed uh, the way they 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 fuse the transistor. So first they use uh, a different way to build the MOSFETs, and now they switch to depletion load with single power supply. Before that, the processors had three power supplies, plus five, minus five, and, and, and plus 12 volts. And um, I'm going to skip that about TikTok. That's a joke. <laughs> and then. And then around that time, Zilog with the Z80, they were, they were so good and, and, and really successful at, at the market. And Intel wanted just, j they just wanted to create a processor that they're going to use as a stopgap for until they released their, their APX 432, which is a 32-bit processor at that time where they had <laughs> the other processors was like 8-bit. It was a special design and, and, and completely new instruction set. And... Uh, it, yeah, it flopped. So the guy who did the 8086, 
his name is Steven Morse, and he was software designer, so he added he did the software based software centric approach to the CPU design. Maybe that was a, that was the right way to go. And the 8086 is 16 bits, like the first 16 bit CPU, and the external bus to the memory was 16 bit too. And when IBM decided to, to take a CPU and do the IBM PC, they went and said, well, yeah, we're going to do that, but we want 8 bit external data bus because this makes the CPU very cheap, much, much cheaper than this one. And they took this one, and the, the designer of the original designer of uh, 8086 called it the castrated version, and this this processor uh, kind of dictated the further development of x86. This is how it started. Anyhow, so the ISA, the instruction set architecture, is a hybrid CISC. CISC is a complex instruction set uh, computer, and RISC is a reduced instruction set computer. And roughly, it means that RISC RISC instructions you can execute like the way they are written in assembly, you can ex execute them the same way on the hardware. And CISC means complex instructions, which means one assembly instruction can be multiple instructions, and those multiple instructions are the simple instructions which then run on the hardware. What Intel did is, is a, it's a hybrid. So you can, you can do some instructions you can execute like straight away in hardware, x86 instructions, some are you can sp you have to split in two or more, and some are microcode, which is even more. Basically, the way they do they do it is like what's what 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 the fastest one wins. We don't care about CISC and RISC or whatever. Just the fastest one, and this is, I think, what what why they why they design it this way. Uh, it's an extension of the original instruction set architecture, the 8008, 8080. It's a little endian. Instruction length is variable. It's not like ARM and some other architectures where you have like a fixed set of bytes, which are the instruction, which is one instruction. So in x86, you have one byte instruction, or you can have 15 byte instruction. And the limit is 15 bytes. If you do 16 bytes, it's GP. Right. So yeah, the processor manuals have the structure of instruction. So if you go to the flow chart, you can actually understand how instructions is is built, like what the bytes, each byte means. And Intel have that too. And th I think this is easier to understand. So there are prefixes, then the opcode, then modRM, and sib, and displacement, and immediates. And we, I'm going to explain it, all of those. Uh, yeah, registers. Those were the first eight. But before the 64-bit extension, and then AMD went and did this, added those, and because they had so much imagination, they just called them R8 until R15. <laughs> those others, they were like, they really mean something, you know? <laughs> okay. So the first thing is the prefix. Uh, you have instruction modifiers, so those prefixes modify the way instruction uh, is executed, and there are encoding ex escapes, like the AVX prefix, the extended AVX, AVX 200, uh, 512, X-Office by AMD, which changes even the encoding. You're going to see later why. Okay, lock, 0F. So if you do a lock before the instruction, means there's a lock cycle that happens on the bus, so this instruction executes atomically. Not every instruction can have lock in front of it. Repeat prefixes, so this goes before, also before the instruction, that's why it's a prefix, which means the instruction before the prefix re is executed multiple times. Operand size override, so on x86 you, you have a default default operand size, it's 32-bit in 32-bit and 32-bit in 64-bit, and if you want to if you want to do a 16-bit a, a 16, a 16 operand, you just put that in front. Segment override, there's like six of them. You, you can select the different segments. And uh, the last two are al also used with different instructions, with the jump instructions, jump uh, condition instructions, as, uh, as branch hints. So you can say, um, jump there, and this is not taken, or this is taken. And 
Intel, Intel implements that and AMD just ignores it. Address size override. Then there's the Rex prefix. The Rex prefix is actually 16 prefixes, 40 to 40F in X, which, which is the AMD 64 extension. And you laugh, I know why. But there's a reason for them to be 16. You're going to see later. <laughs> um, yeah, and that gives you the additional registers and size extensions and fun like that. And then AVX. Then the opcode comes. It's a single byte. Which, which, which denotes the basic operation, and it's mandatory. There are computer designs which don't have opcodes, like not mandatory opcodes, like the one instruction computer and the zero instruction computers. Insane stuff. The opcode is a byte, which means you have two, 256 opcodes, but we have more instructions. And if you look at the map, let me see how that works. No. Let's try this one. Okay, so both both uh, the processor manuals have oh, great. Okay, so both processor manuals have the opcode maps in in there, so you could just start and say. Uh, uh, instruction zero zero is an add EBGB, and uh, B means a byte, and uh, that's the source operand, and that's a destination operand. And G means general purpose register, and E means a register or memory a reference. This is the same, but with with different size, like sixteen, thirty-two, and, and so on. So y you know, if you look at the opcodes, you just know which instruction is. This is how it's defined. And one thing you can see, for example, that all the bytes, all the instructions with the high nib with the high nibble zero, they all have the same operands, and this was the initial design. So that you're going to see later also. So they went and said, the last bit of the opcode, when it's zero, then it's then it's then it's a byte, like byte size operand. And if it's a one, then it's a, a variable size. And if it's a two, then the operands are switched. So basically, what the design designers did is um, save as many bytes and bits as possible, so you can have the shortest opcode possible. So you can save some bytes in the instruction cache and so on. Okay, and because because 256. Uh, entries simp simply don't cut it. We have more instructions. You have ex escape sequences. So you have to have a way to tell the decoder and the f uh, to to say, well, this is not a single byte instruction. This is a multiple byte, multi mu like two byte instruction, for example. So they take the zero f, like the f, and that's not an instruction. That's an escape. So when you see when it, when you are a decoder and you see an f, means we're going to switch to the extended to the extended opcode op op map. So that's why some instructions are two byte size, like some opcodes. And this is, for example, 0F opcode is a two byte opcode. 3D now on AMD is 0F, 0F. And the instructions themselves are encoded with the immediate byte, which is kind of crazy. 0F38 uh, is an escape to the SSE and 3A2. And uh, yeah, I think I can show that too. This is the secondary opcode map, and you escape there with zero F. And additionally, because you, I mean, if you escape there, if it's a one map, you get another two hundred fifty-six. But you probably need more, so you go even crazy and say zero F zero zero is. Let's just let's do zero one. That's easier. Is move UPS. If you have a prefix in front of it, and also 0F01, you get move, move SS and the prefix 66. So you also use the prefixes, and you get like four 
four rows for two bytes, actually three bytes with the prefix. So you have to pay attention to the prefix when you decode that, and so on and so on. And then, the, in the same way they did the escape for the second to the secondary opcode map, they also did the escape to AVX prefix, which is C4 and C5. Those are instructions which are invalid in 64-bit. XOP is also uh, also a pop instruction in 64-bit, but depending on the addressing mode, it can also mean uh, XOP. So w this goes to show that you know the instruction decoder, like in the hardware, is very very complex on x86 because you have to pay attention to all that. This everything has to be in hardware. Next. Yeah. So as you, as you saw, that the, the manuals list the opcodes in hex, but we should look at, at them in octal. Maybe that shows something interesting. <laughs> Somebody on the, on the internet said, for some reason, after everybody misses all of this. Even I missed it, and Michael Matz told me, you should look at the opcodes in octal, and you're going to see it. And um, if you, yeah, let's let's just go this way. So if you look at the opcodes and look at the, that's in that's in octal. If you look at the last bits, you see what I was telling. So the first, the last, the least significant bit is zero, which means the width. So your 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 operands are byte operands, and if it's a one, it's a sixteen thirty two or six, uh, sixty four bit. And if you use the second leasing, the, uh, the second bit shows the direction. For example, if it's a zero, then it's a e GBEB, and if it's a one, it's EBGB. And if you go and look at the, that's the add, and if you look at the OR, that's the same thing right there. So, so basically, when the guys designed the initial in instruction set, they were actually even encoding like using bits in the opcode, even in the, f in the byte, just to save space. And this is, this, this is how they were defined. So op uh, the first, uh, that, that's, in that's in octal, arithmetic, arithmetic logical operations. So 0p until 0 to 7, so you use the, you use the last three bits, octal. And if it's a zero zero something, then it's the ad, those are the add operations. Zero one are the or operations. Zero two are the uh, add with carry, and so on and so forth. The next group is ink push pop and data movement, and so on. And if you look at that, you see the first the the the, the, the yeah the first. The second, yeah, the second. Uh, we start from here. The second three bits are zero, and those are like the add, and so, and somebody stick those in there, <laughs> and then the or start, and then address with uh, add with carry, and so on and so on. So this was the initial encoding. Okay. After the opcode, you have a another byte which is called mod RM. This byte is optional. If it's missing, because we, again we want to save space in the instruction cache, the register field is in the opcode, and I can show you this. It's in the so there it does. Oh yeah, so the B something instructions they're all moves, and the register is implicit, so B0 is moved to AL, and B1 is CL, and so on. So you don't need a mod RM to encode those registers. If you look at the opcode, you know which registers, which register is meant. And the IB means uh, immediate, so that's encoded in the instruction itself. And if you want to select the extended registers, you need to put a rex register in front, uh, a rex prefix, but this is coming. Right, M mod RM, so two bits for mod, Three bits for reg and another three bits for RM, and uh, Rex, like the AMD64 extension, adds one bit to reg and to R RM. Why is that? Because with three bits, you can you can specify eight registers, 
and if you want to specify 16 registers, you need another bit, and this is how they do it. This is why you need the Rex prefix for the additional registers. Right, so mod describe the address, describes the addressing mode. So if it's three, it means you do register direct addressing, so two registers. And if it's not three, there it, it describes the register indirect mode, like there's a displacement coming after, and so on. Reg specifies the register-based operand. RM specifies either the next, the other register, or the memory operand. And if it's a, if it's a register indirect mode, then this says what the memory operand is. And the mod RM says if you need an additional byte, which is the SIB byte, comes afterwards, and you need that additional byte to finally decode, the, uh, to, to finally specify the operands, and this is done when you set mod to zero and RM to five. This means after the mod RM, there's a SIB byte. And the SIB byte is a scale. Was there a question? Okay, and the SIB byte is the scale index base byte, which is also like scale two bits, index three bits, and base. And Rex adds to those two uh, the same way. And um, for that type of addressing, you use the scale to specify the scale factor. There's like two bits, which means scale factor of zero, two, uh, one, two, four, and eight. You're gonna see later what I mean. The index part specifies the register that contains the index portion, and the base part specifies the register that contains the base portion, and the effective address is done by doing scale multiplied by index plus base plus offset. And this is an example of SIB addressing. So the base part is in this register. That's the in the index, yes, and that's the scale. And that's an additional offset right there. And if you look at the, at, at, the, at the instruction, so SIB is C3, so this is the instruction. 48 Rex, move, 94 is the mod RM, C3 is the SIB, and the offset is 1000 in hex, and you start counting backwards because, because it's a little endian. So this is four bytes of offset they're right there. And if you split the C3, you can see that the base register is 3, and the base register 3 is RBX, and that's 3 because, yeah, I have to show this. The, the way x86 in, in enumerates the registers is RX is 0, like think of, think of the fields of mod RM and SIB, RX is 0, 1, 2, 3, Somebody was like, Rx, and then he was illiterate. <laughs> RSC, RDA, RBP, RSP. It's like eight registers, three bytes, three bits. <laughs> so, yeah, so base is three, which is RBX, and index is zero, which is RIX, and scale is three, which is two to the power of three, eight. And um, what else? Oh yeah, we have we have 64-bit registers, which means yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna explain this later. This is specified with this bit. So Rex has four bits, and the width bit is one, which means 64-bit registers, and this means too, like RDX. And RDX comes from from reg from the mod reg field of the mod RM, which is two. 0, 1, 2, RDX. This is, how it, this is how the addressing is done. So when you do this a long time, you just look at the instruction and know what's happening. It's just right there. <laughs> okay, and after, after the SIB byte comes the displacement, which is a signed offset. It can be absolute, which, which is added to the base of the code segment, or it can be relative, like RIP relative can be one, two, or four bytes. And in 64-bit, it's extended to, to, to eight bytes if the operand's specification is 
64 bit. So, for example, here, there's the offset, four bytes. And, and the last in the, in the instruction order are the immediates. They're immediate because they are like in the instruction itself. It can be one, two, four, or eight bytes. When the default operand size in 64-bit mode, they get, they get sign extended. Like, for example, we, we, the instruction is move dead beef into ARX, and this gets sign extended to 64-bit. And there are some moves to general purpose registers, which can specify 64-bit immediate values. So you, if you want to put a 64-bit value into a register, like with one instruction, you do this with those. So for example, if you want to put dead beef cafe babe into RX, you can do it. And if you look at the opcode, it has the, uh, the, the rex prefix. It has the opcode and doesn't have mod RM or sib or anything. It just has the 64, the 8 bytes there. Right, so Rex is uh, uh, the 64-bit extension AMD did, and um, uh, this is the right there in the top. This is how the Rex byte looks. So the first is a four, and you were laughing, and the first four bits have to be four because otherwise you cannot recognize that it's a Rex prefix. Otherwise, it's an it's a, it's an ink instruction or deck. And ink, single byte ink and deck instructions are invalid in 64 bit. You have to use a two byte version. That's why. That's why they had to use. That's why they had to use a whole, a whole line. And uh -huh. right. So the four. The were ink. And uh, the ones. So the ones starting with 48 until F are the deck. Instructions, those sing, single single byte instructions, and they were just. And I, when I was talking to the guy, to the guys who designed this thing, they said, "Well, we were looking for a full set of 16 instructions we can reuse." And w after looking at instruction traces, we saw that ink and deck are like not used very often. And the two byte ink and deck instructions, which are with a mod RM prefix, um, uh, with a mod RM not prefix, they they're not so often, so you're not going to strain the instruction cache too much. So, this is this is this is the decision that that was made at the time. Why, which instructions to uh, to make invalid in 64-bit? That's why Rex is like a full set of 16 prefixes. Okay, um, it must come immediately before the opcode, so you can have other prefixes, then Rex, and then the opcode. And uh, when it's specified, but it doesn't mean anything, it's just ignored. Yeah, and this is what I was explaining. So you have to recycle some instruction bytes so, can, so the decoder can recognize it. So you kill the single byte, the ink index, and in 64-bit you use the modern M versions. S uh, uh, Rex, what, what did it uh, do? So it gave the ability to have 64-bit virtual addresses and RIP 64-bit, 64-bit physical addresses, and this is in implementation speed. This is what, what the SJ guys were talking about. The, the physical address is 64-bit, but it's not really 64-bit because memory addressing costs money and blah, blah, blah. So Intel has it to 44 bits and, and so on. You get the flat address space. There's no, no segmentation. The general purpose registers are widened to 64-bit, and the default operand size remains 32-bit because most of the instructions are fine with just using 32-bit operands and not 64-bit. And if you want to if you want to have 64-bit operand it's either sign extended or as you saw before you can have certain instructions we can put where you can have 64-bit immediates. Yeah. Sure. Long mode Uh, it's a so there's a bit you set long mode and you have first you have to switch paging on and then, and then you set long mode in SDR. 
Yeah. And then you have to do a long jump so you can refetch rip so that you can you can look at that's in that's in head underscore sixty four that s in in the kernel. You can see how it's done. Uh, is there any benefit of keeping the instruction set compatible with the 8086? Uh, I mean, <laughs> you usually want to operate on 64-bit registers when using the long mode. So, well, not really. You no. you want to use you want to operate on 32-bit values. That's the mo that's the highest portion of operands in instruction streams. Okay. Y you have 32-bit values. 32-bit 32-bit is enough. And if you if you really have to do, well, that was also a design decision, you know. So if you do 32-bit operands, that keeps your instruction keeps your keeps your code smaller, like assembly. I see. You know. Okay. okay. Any more questions? Right, so if you want to have 16-bit operands in 64-bit in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in long mode, you, ha you can use rex, but the width bit has to be zero, and you have to add the operand size override prefix, the 66, and then you get, then you get, then you get this. So this is a 16-bit register, R13, but the, and and and, and it has this operand size override prefix. And uh, if you don't have the operand uh, operate, operate, opera size override prefix, but you have a rex prefix, the code segment d bit des defines the, the default operand size, which means if it's a zero, then it's 32 bit. And if you want to have 64 bit operands, you have to say, set the width bit to one. So you have to have a rex prefix. For example, here the width bit is zero, so you are doing 16-bit, and this is also 16-bit. So this is a, a this is an address that points to 16-bit. Okay. Right. So we said that already. So eight new GPRs, and they're they're um, and you, they're specified by using bits 0 to 3 from the rex prefix. And in order to address eight, 16 registers, you need another bit. And how, it, how this is done, li like the R bit, bit 2, rex R, extends the modern M reg. We saw that before. The X bit extends the index of SIB, and the B bit extends the base, the base of modern moder M, the RM part. You can also address the least significant byte registers. So it's on the next, yeah. So before Rex, you, you, you could address the, those and those, but not those. And uh, this was added by the AMD64 extension that you can have uniform byte address, uh, register addressing and uh, you're gonna see later how. And uh, the high portions of uh, A, of A, B, C, and D registers are only addressable when you don't have a rex prefix. And uh, yeah, those are selectable with the B set to one. And you also get eight additional SSC registers, XMM zero to 15. Okay, examples. The first one, yeah, you have the rex prefix, and the width is set to one, so you have a you have a 64-bit register. So you move from Rx to R Rbx. But the way this is AT&T syntax, so this is the source and this is the destination, unlike Intel syntax, which is the other way around. Um, if you wanna, if you wanna move 32-bit values. You just drop the rex prefix, so the instructions the instruction is one byte shorter. Just drop it, and you have ax, abx, ebx. And if you want to move 64-bit values in the extended registers, 
you have to specify both the R bit and uh, set the R bit in the B bit in the Rex. That's why the Rex is 4D. And um, R8 is those are zero, and the and there's the fourth bit, which is the most significant one, which makes it eight. So that's the eighth register, and that's nine, and that's why it's R9. Okay. This is how it's done. And if you want to do the same, the same thing here, but with the extended registers, you keep the R and the B bit set because with those you select the extended registers, but you, cle you clear the width bit, which s falls back to default operand size and 64 bit, which is 32 bit. Right, and then the, those byte register addressing, the SIL. So only with the presence of Rex, the, the, the instruction is already, uh, uh, is, is comparing bytes, like eight, that, mean, that means a byte, eight bits. So if you, if you add the, the, the Rex register, it selects those, those additional registers which, which weren't available before the Rex prefix. What's that? Right. So, this is a uh, this is addressing the byte registers of the extended of, of the new of the new. It's like R R14, and that's done with the Rex prefix and the B1. So the B1 se selects the register when it's set. Right here, you select those. What else? Oh yeah, and those are addressable only without the Rex prefix, so there's no Rex prefix here. This is how I do it. Something else Rex added are the is the RIP relative addressing. So addressing like you add, like so you subtract the current value of of RIP, subtract minus uh, you subtract seven from it, and then you put it into RBP. And this way of addressing uh, is very helpful for uh, program-independent code position. Sorry, position-independent code, and uh, 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 you, it's very it's much easier when you access global global data. And uh, the RIP relative addressing was only in control transfers in legacy mode, like in 32-bit mode. So this was added, and uh, the effective address. is calculated by adding the offset to the value sorry that uh, that was a wrong before so it adds it 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 adds the offset to the value of rip of the next instruction so it has to size this one so that you compute compute the rip of the next one and then it adds it because you cannot know yeah and this is how you get the effective address. And this is done with with a mod RM. And the mod has to be 0, and the RM has to be 5. But in order to do that, uh, in legacy mode, you had 4-bit uh, uh, displacement encoding with, with in legacy in, uh, with, with this addressing mode. But now in 64-bit, you have to do it with the SIP, additionally. So this, you have to do this and that, and then s generate a SIP byte, which has base 5 and IDX 4. And yeah, this is the very first instruction in VM Linux. It's a RIP relative addressi addressing. Now, that's VM Linux. And uh, the the bootstrapping code comes before that, so it's actually in 16-bit, the first, the very very first. <laughs> okay, and then you have the AVX prefixes. Again, you take an instruction and you 
recycle it. So C4 in legacy mode means load far pointer in, seg in segment register, so load far pointer into ES. But if you want to do AVX instructions, you have to, so this byte gets recycled, and it means AVX now. It means VEX now. And ve AVX actually has two versions. The C4 generates a three byte opcode, and XOP does the same thing, but there you have 8F. So when you look at the AVX three byte instruction, the opcode is this. So the f either have C4 or 8F, and then you have R, X, B, and W, which is uh, similar to Rex, but not Rex. Those five bits select additional opcode maps, and uh, which makes it more packed. I mean, you have five bits to select additional opcode map, uh, map, and before that you have you had two bytes like 0F, 38, and if you have five bits, you save a lot on, on, on instruction size, and we want to do that all the time. The, the, the two-bat version is done with C5, which is not a re recycled instruction, load far pointer into DS, and those are like the 120-bit scalar in most common 256-bit AVX instructions, and it has only R bit. The other ones I'm explaining later. So this this is the format of the two-byte VEX, a two-byte AVX instruction. Right, and VEX has to precede the first opcode byte, and whenever those prefixes are present, you get an undefined opcode, and the bits, the registers are specified in one's complement. So, for example, if you have a register field that is zero, it means the fifteenth register, and if it's all ones, it's the first, like opposite to what was before. Right, and this is this is what all bytes mean. So, R seven is the inverted uh, bit to mod RM reg, and the six. Is the index also in, uh, inverted, and then C base, and then map select, and when map select is zero, that's reserved, and one selects the secondary opcode map, which I've seen, I've shown al already, and two selects the zero F thirty eight three byte opcode map, and three blah blah and so on, and eight to one F select selects X uh, X op maps, which is AMD specific. By like the the third byte can that's that's the 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 width bit from Rex. And those four bits select the source or destination register, also in one's complement. Uh, the vector length. If it's a zero, it's 128 bit, and if it's a one, it's 256. And uh, those two, the last two bits are uh, select those prefixes. Okay. Then there's AVX 512, another another prefix. 62, which is the bound instruction. It's invalid in 62, 62, 64 bit. It's four byte long specification of opcodes. It has 32 registers, and those registers are 512 bit. It has additional register, mask registers, K0, K7, and it's a lot of fun. Okay, that's the encoding, roughly. I mean, you can do, I don't know, a lot more about it, but this is the rough, how it looks, more or less. Now on to kernel hex. So yeah, wh when I was, when I when I did the, the decoder, I was thinking, well, only decoding is is not fun enough, 
So I would like to dump some parts of the of the kernel, like interesting parts, and this is one of them. Like, like alternatives is something we do in the kernel where we re replace instructions at runtime. So the kernel is done, ready, built, and it's loaded in the memory, and then we boot, and then we see, okay, we have this hardware feature, and we have an instruction for this hardware feature, so let's replace it. This is what the alternatives does. For example, the whole SMP locking code has a lock prefix in front of it, and we patch that out when we boot on one CPU. And when we online the second CPU, we add those prefixes again because we want to do locking. And before that, it's enough if you, do preemp if you pr disable preemption because you're running on one CPU. This is also done with, with the alternatives. Another thing that's done is, for example, RDTST, like reading the timestamp counter. Uh, RDTST is a speculative instruction, which means it can be reordered. So you have the instruction stream and you do RDTSC, but that doesn't mean the CPU is going to do it at that point. It can do it before that or after that. And you want to you have a barrier before and after. And the barrier, so if you want to do the barrier, you have to do a fencing instruction. And on AMD, that's mFence. And on Intel and Centaur, it's LFence. And um, we select whether to do mFence or LFence, depending on which, what machine we're running, with alternatives. So this is patched at during boot before we enable SMP. It's like patching passes happens on the BSP in the first processor. Yeah, it happens once during boot. We can, no, no, we, we, we can do it, it's possible, but I cannot think of a use case of doing it later. <laughs> yeah, well, sure. Yeah. Yeah, I think we can, yeah, I think you can do it. So patching is not a problem. You have to, yeah, you have to think of the details. Yeah, you can use that. You can use that. You can use that, but yeah, it's more expensive because it's, it synchronizes. Yeah, yeah. It depends on market architecture. Sometimes, even with bears, it's faster than RDTSCP. Yeah, it also writes, writes into another register. So if you don't want to clobber that register. So it's adding additional pressure when, when, when it's done. And if you don't need it, you don't have to do it. Yeah. Oh, and RDTSCP wasn't there before, right? So it, it happened at some point. And before that, there wasn't there wasn't any RDTSCP, so you had to do RDTSC. That's the only thing you have, so you have to you have to fence it, right? And we even do bug workarounds with with alternatives. So this is an old Pentium bug <laughs> that when you read from the uh, from the epic, you have to when you write into the epic, you have to read before that. <laughs> what what this thing does is it goes in. Uh, for certain Pentiums, it replaces the move instruction, move from Epic register with Exchange, so that you can. <laughs> right, and uh, the 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 reason to have alternatives is like you want to optimize your generic kernel, so you can have one kernel image and run it on every on every hardware, like on every x86 hardware, and still be as optimal as possible. I think that's that's a good thing. So this is one example. Um, so the alternatives are, are a bunch of structs which describe, which have enough information so that you can re replace the old instruction with the new instruction. And this is one struct. At this address, we have this instruction, which does call some function. And the size, it's five, so five bytes. And the instruction we want to replace is pop count. Pop count counts the 
one bits in a register, population count. So even the alternatives code itself gets replaced. So what the normal, what, what the kernel has when, when you build it, that's the call, and that's the software version of, of pop count, H weight, Hamming weight. And when we detect a CPU that has a pop count implementation, so it has a pop count instruction implemented in hardware, we want to do that. So we go and we take the pop count instruction and we stick it in here. And this is what, what's, what the alternatives do. So they boot, and you see, OK, this CPU supports pop count. OK, so we go and we replace this instruction with this one. So you have a function call which can be arbitrarily long, and now you have one instruction in hardware. It's a good thing. Yes? You may know a bit that, that lucky that uh, the call queue instruction and the pop count instruction have exactly the same number of bytes. Yeah. What happens then? If they don't have? Yeah. Yeah, well, th this, is, this is a situation which, which is like solve 50%. If, if the instructions, the, the, the replacement instruction is shorter, that's okay. It's added, and then we add knobs. If the replacement instruction is longer, that doesn't work. So you have to pay attention that the replacement instruction is shorter or equal to the size of the old instruction. Yeah. Why couldn't we just extend the original instruction by a few bytes? Yeah, we can. Right. We can, but we have to replace like every every. Yeah, instruction. that's true. And we have to measure how how long does that takes. Yeah, well, the added sure. knob might add some uh, some overhead, but yeah. uh, actually, with some instructions, I'm pretty sure that there are multiple ways to encode them, like uh, prepend an uh, uh, prepend uh, uh, size override prefix. No, no, you can do anything. You can, right. you can, you can do knobs after the yeah, original instruction. Yeah, I know, but if you, if you add knobs, that adds another instruction. But the instruction is variable length, which means um, if you encode it in a different way, maybe you can just compensate for those extra bytes that you need. Hmm. Without yeah. the incurred, I, I mean, the, the, the instruction decoder doesn't add any, uh, any uh, CPU cycles if the instruction has unneeded prefixes, for example, right? That, that would mean that we, you would need instruction encoder in the kernel. No, no. Well, yeah. Yeah, well, you, yeah. Well, well actually, the, the right way to fix it is to change the alternatives so that it actually sizes the instructions. And we can, we can do that almost. But not really, because the um, the assembler, I was talking to Misha about it, it does two passes when it converts, when it generates assembly. And uh, you, can, you can do some magic with labels and then do label after minus label before, and it gives you the size. And you can do that, but that doesn't work all the time. So yeah, I would like to do that. I would like to make the assembly, I would like to make the alternatives uh, just know how long the instructions are, just adjust them. So if the, if the original instruction is, is, is shorter, you add knobs. And if the original instruction is longer, you don't do anything, because we add knobs anyway uh, during patching. Yeah, so this is something that we should do at some point. The question is, how do I find these places? You mean you mean find with? Oh yeah. Okay. What? So all the instructions that we replace are in a section called alt instruction replacement. So these are the instructions we replace. The original. Uh, Right. Okay. So the, there's the alt instructions section, which has 
a bunch of struct old instructions there and they're put in there so you start you find in the L file the alt instruction section and then you start reading size of alt instructions this is how I find it I'm gonna come to that this is another thing another thing we we did for the alternatives so <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so um, there's this thing called static CPU has safe. So the static CPU has is a way to ask whether the CPU has a certain feature. But the static CPU has is supposed to be very fast. So this thing works also with alternatives. But <laughs> there's a possibility to do static CPU has before the before the alternatives have run, which means the results static CPU has will bring at that point are invalid. So you have to do a, a static CPU has safe, and we did that with <laughs> with replacing it twice. So this is this is the function switch to, and the original instruction we want to replace is the jump to this address, and the jump to the uh, the jump to this address is the call to static CPU has safe and this is the safe way to do it so before and when you look at the code so w w when you look at the, the, the VM Linux the, it is done this way that by default you right by default you simply okay let, so y when you come here with the assembly you jump here, 940, uh, 490, and you do the safe, which is the default case, which means before you boot, you do the static version because the, the, the safe version, because the sta safe version is guaranteed to work, doesn't matter when. But we don't want to do the safe version all the time, we just don't, we want to do it at the beginning before we apply the alternatives because the safe version is also slow. So, what the alternatives, alternatives code does is we go and we replace, we replace twice. So the first, the first, first time we replace this one with a jump to the 9e, and the 9e is um, is um, is the case which says that the the safe is the case which says that you don't have, even have to run the safe version because the feature is not there. So you just skip everything and jump over here. And the second replace we do, we go and replace this instruction with nothing and we overwrite, we put a knob in here and then this code is executed. You have to look at the C code and see what it means. But yeah, it's an optimization and it's insane. <laughs> Right, so alternatives, you have two sections, and the alt instructions contains the info which is enough to do the runtime replacement. So this is an assigned 32-bit offset to the original instruction, and this is the offset to the replacement. And this is the CPU ID feature bit, which, which you should do the replacement for. And then this is the length of the old instruction and the length of the replacement instruction. And the linker generates those proper offsets and they're there. And when you boot, you read those offsets and you go and say, you go and say address of this plus this. And that gives you the virtual address of the original instruction. And then address of, so what I'm trying to say is those offsets are relative to this struct. And this is why you rely on the linker. So what happens is this is the alt instructions and this is the replacement and you go to alt instructions and you go up to the original instruction. That's, that's what you do. Like the offset we load out plus, uh, plus, plus this offset. And then you do offset we loaded out plus replacement offset and you get to the replacement instruction. So, right. So for example, this is the the offset of the instruction we computed, and it's right there. 
And the address of the replacement instruction is this one. And this is the section. So this is how it's done, roughly. Right. How much time do I have? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> right, so, yeah. So this is the, the static CPU has safe where, yeah. So the code now, it, inf it enforces, E9 is a jump with four byte offset. It enforces those. And um, I wanted to do a patch that used two byte offsets. And uh, in order to, uh, well, so <laughs> when, when we do this computation, this section is far, far away from the original instruction. And it can happen that when you do those jumps, the original, the, the, the original instruction can be a two-byte jump, and the replacement instruction can be a five-byte byte jump, and this cannot work. Because if the replacement is bigger, you're going to overwrite the next instruction. And um, this is why currently we enforce five-byte jumps, but it would be better to have two-byte jumps or, sh or, or three-byte jumps because the, 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 the shorter the instruction is the better, letter, uh, less pressure, instruction ca cache pressure. So we needed to control those, and currently we enforce, in, enforce four, four byte, five byte jumps, but they can be smaller. And what I was thinking is like parse the VM Linux and binary edit the jumps. And uh, what happens is w when we build the kernel, there's this tool, Relux, which we used to generate Relux, which we call before we build VM Linux. And I've hacked in a version where you can actually edit the ELF, edit the VM Linux, and do that, like shorten the jumps. And this is an example. So yeah, the, originally you have, uh, so you, you generate two byte jumps and the replacement is five byte jumps, but you want to have that. and. Uh, and uh, I have a patch that does that. I need to just and I just need to test this more. So this is much better. You know, you don't have to load those. So you can load those. They're going to be knobs, and they're going to be discarded much earlier than decoded. And what I'm trying to say is, when you start looking and you start decoding the VM Linux, you see stuff like that, and it gets very interesting. <laughs> yeah, we we we've been wanting to. To, to patch VM Linux for a long time because sometimes you just cannot 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 specify with enough l uh, assembly and linker magic what you want to do with the, with the uh, alternatives or instructions for that matter. So maybe editing the L file before it's f after it's the code is generated would be a good thing. And this is one like the two are written. It gives, it shows me those, so you can see straight away that whether whether the editing happened and whether it looks fine or not. Right. So I, I, yeah, I did the original Elf. Uh, uh, um, I did run the tool, which I, so my decoder kind of like dumps the alternative sections, and uh, I did diff the original output and the new and new output. So, for example, you can see that in mul in multiple cases, this jump is a five byte and it can be four byte, and this by jump is five byte and it can be two byte. So we can save something. I mean, is it measurable? No, maybe not. <laughs> but at least, but it's it's a it's a it's a first attempt. And the instruction decoder is something you can use for stuff like that. For example, I've been trying to do this before, and you have to object dump and just scroll up and down and try to understand what it means. And if you write a tool that actually shows you the addresses and stuff like that, that's kind of helpful. It's, it's, it's f faster. OK, uh, next. Should we stop? <laughs> yeah. So the, the next thing is exception tables. We have those things called exception tables. and what we do there is 
there's a possibility that some execution or some instruction might fail, but fail in a way where the execution sta state can be rest rest like restarted, continued to some somewhere else. And this is what those exception tables do. So when you hit the exception, you go and look through those tables and, s and look for the address, for the virtual address where the, the exception happened. And if you have it there, you jump to the fix up code, which is another address. And um, what are they good for? So yeah, accessing process address space, get user, all the get user things do exception tables. So whenever user space is not mapped and you get a page fault, the page fault handler walks to the exception tables and does, yep. Can you customize when you want these um, exceptions to happen for your custom calls? Well, exceptions are generated by the CPU. Mm -hmm. So every instruction has, has a set of ex exceptions, maybe even a zero set, exceptions that, that are generated. So not really. Okay. It's, it's, it's not arbitrary. Okay. You know? So some instructions generate, generate exceptions and some no. Or depending. Generate an illegal instruction. Yeah, you you can try that. You can you know so so Oliver says you can generate an illegal instruction exception. So you can fumble the bytes and execute them, something like that. Yeah. Or you can do UD2. Yeah. So how do they look like? It's basically the same stuff as, as the alternatives. But this time it's only there are only two members in the struct, the address of the instruction and the address of the fix up. And whenever so how do you get this fix up? Uh, how do you get those addresses? I mean it's an int, so thirty two bit uh, generally, and you get you, you, you take the address of this thing of e ENSN and you add the offset to itself. This is the same way the uh, uh, alternative instructions are computed. So when you walk, when you, when you iterate over the e exception table, you do that, and then you compare it with the address you faulted at, and if, you, if it's the same address, you jump to the fix up. So you do, you write, you write, fix up into, into the Rex IP and then you continue. For example, this is nasty. So what this means is you read MSR and if you get, generate an, ex, an, an exception during reading the MSR, you move, you, you, you have to return EIO. So what happens is um, this is the exception table which is the, uh, the 2B is a reference to the label 2, like a backwards reference to 2. So what this does is generates the address of like the, the offset to here, from here to here. And what this does, it generates the offsets from where this thing gets issued to here. So basically, basically this, the struct exception tail. And when the CPU comes here and does read MSR, an exception happens. The fix up code iterates over the exception table, finds this address, and says, okay, I found you. And then jumps to 3B, which is the fix up code in the 3B thing moves AIO into the error, and the error is a register, and then we ju jump to 2, which is after the read MSR. If there, no, there, if no exception happens, we just zero the error, so we return 0, and read MSR succeeded, and, and we're done, and 
we are not executing this part because this is another section, this is far away. So what comes afterwards is dependent on the compiler. And in assembly, it looks like this. So the exception table is also a special section. And this is where the instruction and the fix up are put. And this is the fix up code. Uh, if fix up code it iterates over those. And yeah. Questions about it? OK. And I just made my tool dump those exception table entries. I mean, it's not very helpful, but it's the beginning. It's the start, so. And this is basically the same function. So you do read MSR, and if you fail, you move minus 5 into ECX and return. Jump labels. One more. <laughs> so jump labels were done for for trace points. You want them to have you want you want to have them in the, in a you want you want them to be low overhead as low overhead as possible. So what happens is um, when trace points are disabled, which is the the normal case, the jump labels are nothing but knobs. So you skip over them. It's a five byte knob. And the tracing code is in the unlikely path, which means this is the path we're unlikely to execute. And GCC puts it far away from the normal path. And whenever we enable a trace point, we over, uh, override the knob with a jump to the tracing code. The good thing about it is you want to have, you want to have knob likely code in the front and then return so that you can you don't stress the instruction cache and you don't load un unnecessary instructions which you're not going to execute so you want to have the unlikely stuff at the back and you do that with jump labels how does it, how does it look like so you want to say if this is dumb design but this is the way it you cannot do it differently. You have to you have to do scat clock stable, which is a false, and you have to do a, a, a negate it again. But this is the current design of jump labels, which needs to be fixed. This is not nobody can understand that. So what's like double negation? What am I supposed to think? Basically, it says if the if the scat clock is stable, basically says if I can use RDTSC, then I do RDTSC, and otherwise I use jiffies. This is what the function does, and what happens is, th this is this is um, this is the static key, key false de de uh, definition. That's the knob, and that's the jump table, and the jump table decides where to go. Basically, whether to go to the to the to the likely path or the unlikely path. Right, in a similar way with the alternatives and the exception tables, there's also something called jump entry, and these are those three, three values. So this is the address of the knob when you want to replace it. This is the label of scat clock, which is the unlikely path. And this is the, this is the name of the, of the key the jump label. And this is what, what my tool dumps. So when you have the key scat clock sca stable, and this is, this is the assembly, and this is the knob, and when jump labels get activated, you go and replace this knob with a jump over here. And if you don't replace the knob, it goes, executes this one, and then it returns. So this is the unlikely path. However, this is also a problem because what that's Peter Peter did that. Well, the the assumption is that 
Sket this is always this is the likely path. So you want to execute that all the time, and uh, like most of the time. So mo all modern CPUs have RDTSC, so you want to do that. And what the code ends up doing is, this is the entry, and then it adds a a, a jump to the RDTSC. So jump labels go come and run, and this is the, the, the state of the VM Linux after everything is booted, so this is the normal case, this is the likely case. So whenever you do scat clock, you go and come here and then you jump to here. But what you want to do is you want to have the knobs here, you want to have the RDTSC here, which is the, unlike, which is the likely branch, and then you want to you wanna call the functions later. Yeah, this is Gfix. And this is not possible currently. So maybe we can fix that with ELF editing. Because the idea is to generate it so that there's the, there's the knob in here, there's the likely p stuff in here, and the unlikely in here, and by default to jump over here, and then when the jump labels run, they override the jump, and they have the likely code here. So you, ca you can generate, you, you can, you can do that with GCC, but the jump labels don't allow you to do that now. So we have to edit, we have to fix that. So yeah, with maybe with, maybe with uh, binary editing. Done. <laughs> Questions? Um. You showed in the beginning that uh, the jump uh, conditional jump instructions can have a hint that's only uh, interpreted on, or only taken into account on Intel processors. Right? Yep. And uh, is there any use of that that's that's made? And could, for example, the likely and unlikely hints uh, make use of that? Yeah. Well, the, this thing there were, there was there was a couple of years ago at LKML where somebody showed that the unlikely and likely things are so stupid and they actually kind of hurt performance. That's why they got removed. So send, sending hint, hints to the branch predictor, I mean, those things are so smart now. It's actually, I don't think that brings anything. You just just do your code and the branch predictor does it already. I mean, branch hints don't help. Not really. But maybe the hardware guys will tell you something. Maybe there's somebody at Intel running traces and performance tests and stuff and using branch hints. And they're going to show you, well, we have 2.3% performance improvement on this benchmark, which doesn't mean anything. But yeah. Okay, Oliver? Or you showed that the default is always the safe. Actually, why? I mean, if the replacement always run, the default could be the longest, and the problem is gone. Oh, you mean a static CPU has safe? Yeah. Well, you want to do the safe version before the alternatives have run. That's only for, for that only for that case, mm. because the safe version is also also the slowest version, and the f the faster version is. Applied by the, by the alternatives. No, I mean the longest in terms of instructions size. Well. Uh, it's not about longest in instruction size, it's about execution. And yeah. Before, when you showed the, the replacement for the instruction, when you have the problem that the replacement could be longer oh, than the. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, here, for example. Yes. Yeah. What, what 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 was the question now? So uh, because you you mentioned that you had the problem of uh, replacing one version and the replacement might be longer. Yes. Mm -hmm. So if the the con the conversion always runs. Yeah. Why not use the longest in terms of size as the default? Yeah, this is what we did. Okay. This was the example. So when you do byte e9, that's the opcode for for four byte jump. Mm. This is why we enforced it. This is where we said jump can be one, two, or five bytes, and we're going to enforce the five bytes, even though, can I show it here? Even though, for example, 
one byte is enough is an offset. So the jump is an signed offset from the next instruction. And what, what the kernel has now is EB5C0000. Because, no, it has E95B0. Because we force the longest. Yeah, we do that. Mm. But it would be better if we, do, if we do the shorter versions. If we can. And if it's not that expensive. Sure, but why do you want to edit the binary if you already have the infrastructure to remove such things? If you have this case, you take this instruction and write it over here, you override the first three bytes of the next instruction. No, you, you can leave in the source the five-byte version. Yeah. But if you already have a table of, of such places to alter, yeah. then you can go through them, and if you s compute it would fit in the two-byte version, use it. Yeah, this, is, this is what my patch does. Yeah, but... Uh, why not at runtime and with the same mechanism? You want to compute every offset at runtime? I know only those who, which are replaced. Yeah. Yeah, but you have to do that anyway. You can do it at runtime, you can write a, do it in build time. I would like to do it in build time because it's easier. Mm. Because at build time, you, can, you write a, a, a C program. In user space, it's much easier. You can use everything. I think the goal is to get the um, to get the text size smaller to reduce pressure on the um, instruction cache. So it makes sense to make it at, to do it at build time and not at runtime because if you do it at runtime, you have to pad this with knobs and you don't save any um, no no any text the, size. You cannot reduce text size because, for example, if you have if you have a three, two byte and five bytes, you cannot move that this back because you have to you have to edit the rest of the addresses down. So normally, what you ha what you do is like you do two bytes in that uh, a three byte knob. But still, it's much better to do it at, at build time, I think. Because it runs, pff, done. So a two byte jump is faster than a four byte, uh, than, than a five byte jump? No. How do you know? <laughs> exactly, it's shorter. So. Think about it. The memory is getting very slow uh, compared to the CPU. No, 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 no. This is in the cache. No. This is in a cache. So you read a 64-byte cache line. And when you see the, the two-byte jump, you're faster with decoding. And when the fetcher, the, the like front-end sees 66, 66, 90, which is a knob with two prefixes, it's going to just discard them. Yeah, but does that help you if, if, if it's not in the L3 cache yet? Because then you have to fetch it from, from no, no, DRAM. No, no, you fetch from, from L1. Always. L1 is Not always. Cache. Of course. So the, 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 front end it gets of the, the front end of the CPU fetches from L1 instruction cache. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. But the L1 might not contain that initially. Yeah, then you have a cache miss. Yeah, Then you have exactly. to go to L2. But if you, if you have shorter instructions, you reduce the risk of evicting code that gets executed later. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we, we just we're not gonna have we're not gonna have more instructions in this case. We're gonna have three bytes less. We're gonna which we're gonna discard. It's not gonna show on any traces, but it's still fun to do. <laughs> <laughs> any more questions? No. Okay. Thank you, guys. <laughs>